what's up, y'all? This is Claire Dunn, and you're listening to TNC Radio Dot Live. Hey, and welcome in. This is TNC Radio Dot Live. And building strong minds with Dr. Christopher Cortman. I'm Tom Kelly. We're going to be with you for the next hour talking about the social black belt last week. And well, a couple of weeks ago when we played it last week, uh, we talked about the first truth around the social black belt. And uh, we, so we've got plenty more to cover here. Dr. Chris says we got plenty to go. How are you doing tonight, Dr. Chris? Well, actually, Tom, I'm having a hard time tonight because um, my dog, Leo, the Pomeranian, is uh, being filmed tonight. He, uh, he takes pictures for money, and he's, uh, he's, he's hawking some kind of dog shampoo. And every time he does one of these little commercials, they send him free products and, and uh, like $100. And he's been making fun of me because his career is more successful than mine. So uh, I'm trying to recover from dealing with an eight-pound dog. Now, who who has to pay the income tax on that? <laughs> you know it, what? It, I'm it not even dog rate. Or, so, yeah. I hope no one from the IRS is listening. To <laughs> I'm, I'm sure they're going. Ooh, ooh, yeah, dog rate. That's what we need. <laughs> dog taxes. Mm -hmm. Yes. It. But uh, that aside, I'm well, thank you for asking. How about yourself? Good. After two weeks of being out on the road, uh, got back in, a couple of thousand miles traveled, and uh, made it home without a scratch on us, so that's good. Where'd you go? Well, we went from here to Alabama, Alabama to Charlotte, North Carolina, North Carolina to Chattanooga, Chattanooga to Crossville, Crossville to Nashville, Nashville, Hot Springs, and Hot Springs back to Houston. Wow. So, yeah, we did, we, did, we did the tour. People in all those cities? People in all those cities. I mean, they, I'm sure there are people in yeah. all those cities, but I mean, uh, yeah. people that you knew. Uh, except for Hot Springs. Hot Springs was just because we heard it was a good place to hang out for a couple of days. And is it? Yeah, it was. It was a lot of fun. Where is that? Tennessee? Arkansas. Hot Springs, Arkansas. Hot Springs, Arkansas. Okay. Fam Obviously, that tells you what I know about yeah, fam Arkansas. Famous for their hot springs. Hmm. Yeah. Hence the name. Hence the name. And the springs themselves now are directed into the hotels where you go in and you soak in the hot springs and they pamper you and massages and all that. I didn't do it myself, but my wife did and really enjoyed it and had a great time. Hmm. That sounds like a worthy destination. Yes, absolutely. I, I would bring my teenage daughter, but that would make her a hot Springsteen. Oh, uh, yes, I what you did there. Okay. Sorry, sorry my writers are on strike. I got to do this alone. <laughs> I th I, actually, I guess they're with the dog tonight. <laughs> they are. They are yeah. with the dog. Yes. Well, before the show goes to the dogs, uh, we talked a little <laughs> bit it's about... Too <laughs> we, we talked a little bit about the first truth and this whole social black belt thing. So back it up a little bit for those who maybe are just catching up for the first time tonight. First of all, what's the social black belt and what was the first truth? All right. So the social black belt comes from an idea that the highest level of training in martial arts is, of course, the black belt. And if you had a black belt in martial arts, you not only would have the highest level of training, but you would be prepared to take on the world. I mean, you, you wouldn't look for trouble, but you could handle whatever life brought you. And if there is such a thing as a social black belt, and that's the, the point of this, you also would be prepared to take on what life is going to bring you, which of course includes disappointments and frustrations and people coming and going in your life and betrayal and abandonment and sometimes abuse and sometimes trauma and sometimes oh economic issues and death in the family and disease and illness and you know all kinds of challenges and it's not as if 
you know, you had the highest level of training, these things wouldn't be difficult or they wouldn't be painful, but rather you would have the skills to handle them. And so, you know, the idea was uh, something I had after years and years of uh, sharing some of these things that people don't know about. We have done a, a relatively poor job as a, a, as a field, the field of psychology, the science of psychology in teaching uh, the masses, what we know, we've been you know, 125 years of of psychology, and we've done a poor job to educate people. So I started to write this book years ago, and it was supposed to be called 10 Things Someone Should Have Taught You By Now. And the, um, the publishing company said, nope, we're going to call it Your Mind, an Owner's Manual for a Better Life. And um, I really wanted them to call it the Da Vinci Code because I knew it would sell more. But anyway, that aside, um, it was uh, we didn't care what they called it because they were going to publish our book. And um, then I came up with this idea. What if we taught these 10 truths to kids and um, came up with an idea of this social black belt? And um, kind of like if you were a, a freshman in high school and you had a social black belt, you could handle bullies and you could deal with uh, assignments to stand up in front of the class and present. And you could express your opinions or your orientations if they were different than others. And you could talk to a complete stranger or uh, go to a party by yourself. Or, you know, you could handle losses and you could handle what life was going to bring you. And um, so to make a very long story short, it worked in terms of the kids who took the course did better than the kids who didn't. And um, we're still hoping to arrange something with uh, with Sarasota County to be in all of the different schools. I just had the opportunity, Tom, to teach last Wednesday some of my program to the number one school in the state of Florida. It's called Pineview. The, uh, it's a school that would not have accepted me, I think, when I was a kid. I wouldn't be smart enough, but um, they let me come back at this juncture and teach these brilliant kids. It's it's a gifted school and uh, wonderfully um, open kids. They want to learn. They're hungry to learn and um, just had a chance to work with them on, on these different kinds of issues. Anyway, wherever we go, the research says it, uh, it makes a difference. It, it helps kids uh, understand things that, you know, for some reason we don't normally teach kids. It's a shame because we have the, the knowledge and the information. So the social black belt has 10 truths and um, long winded me is trying to get into the very first truth, which is all about where our feelings come from and how they're not, they're not strangers from another dimension. Um, people really don't understand where their feelings come from. And most people, you could stop an adult on the street, Tom, and ask them, you know, um, where do your feelings come from? And they would say, well, they come from the things that happen. They come from the circumstances in your life. They come from what other people do and say. And we know that that is not true, that um, emotions, there's, there's four parts that I want to talk about tonight, if I can get them all in. But if not, we'll go on to the next time. But the first part is that our emotions come from our perception of things. And so I want to take you back to um, November of 2016, I believe, but it doesn't matter. It could be November of any year where there's a uh, an election. And this was for President of the United States. And I'm in my office the following morning, which would be a Wednesday, these things usually happen on Tuesdays, and uh, my eight o'clock is pacing around my office. She is uh, like 58-ish year old married woman, and um, she looks at me and she says, if you so much as voted for that man, I will never darken the door of your office again. And then we process all of that, the feelings that she has about the brand new president. 
And then nine o'clock walks in. And this is a gentleman who's 89 years old, going on 90. And he says, you know, I'm feeling really good about the election last night. I think this country is going to turn around. I am just so thrilled by what happened. And I'm sitting in my chair practically laughing to myself that were you guys watching the same results? I mean, how could the same news report give two people such dramatically different responses? I mean, they both knew who won, but their feelings were dramatically different. And what is that about? Obviously, the results of the election did not cause feelings. It's the perception the people had about the election that causes the feelings. You see the same thing at sporting events. Some people are exhilarated. Some people are angry or just demoralized or defeated. They're so sad. Years ago, the Kansas City Chiefs were eliminated in the first round of the playoffs after a 13-win season, and they literally set up a place for people to come and talk about their pain called Chiefs Grief. <laughs> and, and it was like, wow, these people really take their football seriously in Kansas City, evidently. But the point being, it's never what happens. It's the way you perceive things that causes your feelings. I think you're going to take me into a timeout here, and then I'd like to tell another story about that, if that's okay. That would be perfect. So let's do that. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back here in just a couple of minutes. You're listening to Building Strong Minds with Dr. Christopher Cortman right here on TNCRadio.live. Stay tuned. This blog is brought to you by the Truckers Network at app.thetruckersnetwork.net. Five awesome tips for finding safe overnight truck parking. Truck drivers face many challenges in their career, and finding safe overnight truck parking is one of those challenges. After the tragic murder of truck driver Jason Rivenberg, Jason's law went into effect to help protect the thousands of truck drivers who need to find safe overnight parking. Although Jason's law was put into place to help drivers, safe truck parking continues to be an issue for truck drivers across America. We've put together a list of tips that will help you make the process of finding safe overnight parking easier for you. Plan your trip. Pre-planning your trip is something every truck driver should consider doing. Not only does it allow you to map out your overnight parking, but it allows you to map out where you can get fuel and food. Before you hit the road, Take a look at your route. Avoid scheduling truck parking in high crime cities or congested areas. Pro tip, download the app Truck Park. With over 200 secure locations, the Truck Park app allows drivers to schedule their overnight parking in advance so drivers don't have to worry about driving around to find a parking spot. Not only is it a relief to have your parking spot booked, but it's also more productive with HOS. Also, if you're a member of the Truckers Network, drivers get instant access to a 15% off promo code to use when booking a parking spot with TruckSpot. You can sign up for just $5 a month. Park early. If you don't choose to reserve your parking spot through Truck Park, we suggest parking early. The majority of safe parking spots will fill up quickly before it gets dark. If you can, start driving early in the morning so that when it's time to quit driving for the day, you won't find yourself fighting for a parking space. Park in a well-lit area. Walmart parking lots are an extremely popular location for overnight parking. Why? Because they're well-lit areas. When planning your trip, it may be difficult to know whether they have well-lit parking available. If you find yourself in a situation where you don't feel safe, talk to your dispatcher. They might be able to help you find secure truck parking. Lock it up. It may seem like a no-brainer, but you'd be surprised as to how many truck drivers forget to lock up their truck and trailer for the night. So before you go to sleep for the night, make sure to lock everything. Insert a dash cam. Dash cams are a great way to provide evidence if your truck was in an accident or vandalized. It's always refreshing to know that you have an extra set of eyes on your truck. This blog was brought to you by the Truckers Network at app.thetruckersnetwork.net.
TNCradio.net. Hey drivers, did you hear music on TNCradio.live that you really liked? Or maybe you heard us interview an author of a book you'd like to read or listen to. You can get the books, music, and other products you hear about by going to our website at www.tncradio.live and clicking on the shopping cart. But my my uh, goal is not to depress or even to sensationalize um, trauma or uh, horror as much as to say, hey, this is a tough story, but there's good news or I wouldn't be telling it. So um, I don't know if I've ever alluded to this story before, but it's a live story. I mean, I just saw this young lady tonight. Um, when she was six years old, her mother evidently had a psychotic break and um, stabbed her 14 times, my little girl. Oh my and um, she recovered physically. She showed me scars all over her body. She was brought to me to, uh, to treat when she was uh, 12, and now she's 13. We've been at it, I don't know, a little less than a year, I suppose. And... Um, she has this perception, Tom, or has had this perception that um, everything is terrible because her own mother tried to kill her. And, um, you know, what's the point of uh, living a life if, um, if, again, your own mother doesn't think you're deserving of love or doesn't even think you're deserving to live. She also tried to drown her in a swimming pool. I mean, the mother was really, really psychotic. Normal parents, you know, that's not something they would do. They might yell. They might scream. They might slap. They're not going to stab you 14 times and try to drown you in the swimming pool. But anyway, so this lady is um, forever in... Um, in lockup and in incarceration but the daughter comes to see me every week courtesy of the uh grandparents who are now the parents and here's the point i have a huge mission i have a big job because this precious little angel um can go through the rest of her life feeling like my life is terrible after all you know she could tell that story and it's true yeah, she'd win, and, and, she'd win most, uh, let's compare who had the worst life. Yeah, she, she <laughs> can usually win that game. Yeah, I would. <laughs> <laughs> it's like when you're playing the card game war and you throw down a king and then the next person throws down an ace and you lose. Uh, you know, she's got the ace in that. But I, I have a different take for her. And I've been sharing it with her, which is imagine... You were stabbed all those times, and really, you should have died. Um, that was a bad enough incident that I don't know that you, you should be living here after that. But what if, what if there is a God, and what if that God said, I'm saving this girl's life because I got stuff for her to do. I'm going to make her amazing. And people are going to listen to her because she's got a story. Not only does she have a story, but she's a young lady of color. And she's got, I'm going to make sure she gets help and she gets an education and she can stand up in front of people and help women or just humans all over the world with her story. Because it's like, yeah, you had a tough life. I get it. But you know what? Let me tell you about mine. And I'm okay today, and I'm alive today, and I'm grateful today. Imagine if we take this story. Imagine if we take your life and we say, this wasn't something terrible. Only temporarily it was terrible. This was what God's going to use, and this is what you're going to do because you're going to have a fabulous life and you're going to make a difference. And we're going to forgive mom because mom was out of her mind. I don't know what she saw when she looked at you. Maybe You know, sometimes when people are psychotic, they hear voices and they see things and you find out later and it's just crazy talk. 
You know, she she may have thought she was seeing a you know a, a demon or something and needed to kill it, or the voices said you got to kill that beast, or you know, we don't know. But we're not staying stuck in hatred and let your mother that one incident define your whole life. We don't want the one incident to define your whole life. What we want is a brand new perception that says, I am blessed. My body's working fine. All I have is a few scars left and a story to tell. And I'm going to do amazing things to help people. And this is how I'm going to do it. And so today she says, I'm, I've been thinking about forgiving my mom. And my ears got all big, Tom, because that's, been, that's coming from me. And... Um, and then she says, but my grandparents are talking me out of it because they think what oh, she did was great. so bad. Yeah. I was like, thanks. <laughs> great. great. But then I had to go into this. Forgiveness doesn't mean that we condone the bad behavior. It doesn't mean what your mom did was OK. It just means that we're not staying stuck there. We're moving on. We're letting it go. And we're going to go do great things. So anyway, all of that to say it's never what happens. It's about the perception of what happens. And I know um, you, Tom, and, and I'm sure some of your audience, uh, you know, are, are, are people of faith. And uh, there's a long story in the book of Genesis about Joseph being betrayed by his brothers, and he ends up going from prison to being the number two man in all of Egypt. And when he had a chance to retaliate against his brothers, he said something really amazing. And that was, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. And I think that's a pretty terrific line, no matter what your take is or your bent is on, on, uh, on faith or the Bible or, or any of those things. It's like, imagine if somebody means harm to you that it could actually turn out for good. So that's the first part of the four parts that I want to get into on um, where our emotions come from. They come never from what's happening, always from our perception of what's happening. And then I want to get into the second one, which is, um, and you stop me when we have to break, but the second part of it is all of our emotions are statements about ourselves. Your emotions, Tom, are statements about you. Um, two of us or three of us or 10 of us can go to the same movie and we could come out feeling different things because our emotions are statements about us. Um, you know, it, 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 the statements about how we perceive the world. I mean, you could read different reviews about movies, and, and that's because people look at them through their own eyes. And, you know, I, I don't know if I ever told this story before, but to me it was a, a classic of uh, an, an 85-year-old retired physician um, who would speak very often uh, in, in session with me by saying, he was a lovely man, or she was a lovely woman. And after I heard that, about six times, about six different people, I finally stopped him and said, do you realize how often you call people, you describe people as being lovely? And he just shrugged and said, no, I, I wasn't aware of that. And I said, do you know what that means? And he was silent and said, no. And I said, it means that you're a loving person. If everybody is so lovely to you, it's because you are loving. It's a statement about you that you put so many people into that category. And you know people like that, Absolutely. that no matter what yeah. happens to them, they have a way of seeing it uh, glass half full, um, positive. Here's what we learned from that. That was a wonderful thing. And, and then, then we, have, we have the Eeyores of the world that no matter what happens to them, you know, they'll find a way, 
you know, I, I remember a guy winning a car. <laughs> he won a car, and right away he started complaining he had to pay taxes yeah, on the car. Yeah. You know, he, got, he won a forty-five thousand dollar new car, and you know, and it's and it's funny because some people, the way they're always going to look at the world, they're going to have that Eeyore take on it, That's always right. uh, down and sad and negative and depressed because that's the way they look at life there are kids uh in school that ever, you ask them about school and every subject is boring mm -hmm. well what do you think about the history boring and then what do you say about boring science boring english boring and you know sometimes i'll tell the kids as i'm teaching them you know your your emotions are statements about you and if you're always bored you're boring <laughs> it's you it's you here's the common denominator in all those classes it's you right it's you you know some kids go to camp how'd you like camp today it was fantastic i did this i did this another kid goes to the same class boring boring yeah. boring same camp same activities everything was lame everything was stupid you know it's a statement about where they are sure in their lives well i tell you what let's take a quick break and continue this discussion you're listening to tnc radio dot live this is building strong minds with dr christopher Cortman, and we'll be right back stay tuned hi i'm dr christopher Cortman. And now for the Mental Health Minute. So I'm working with a woman, and she tells me that every Sunday she calls home to hear a litany of criticisms and complaints from her mother about the way she's living her life. And she says, most Sundays I hang up in tears. And I said to her, you're never going to stop calling your mother on Sundays, are you? And she says, no, I really need to do that. I said, okay. What if we try something a little different this time, I said. She said, okay, what would that be? I said, why don't we make a list of 10 things that you think your mother is likely to say? And when she says any of them, check it off instead of getting upset or hurt or challenging it just check off let's, let's see how you do she said well that's interesting the next week she came back into session and before i could even sit down she said i got eight out of ten i got eight out of ten she was so excited she said what are you talking about she said what that that list you gave me to do I wrote down 10 things that my mother might say, and I got eight of them right. I'm so excited. So excited. A week ago, tears. She said, now I understand, and I can even predict what my mother's likely to say. So here's the point. People stay in character. Mom's going to be mom. Jerry's going to be Jerry. Jennifer's going to be Jennifer. They're probably going to stay as they are throughout the entire movie of your life. When we start to understand and expect what people are going to do, we're less inclined to be upset by their behavior. At Hot Shot Secret, we share the science behind common diesel problems. For example, stiction. Found throughout the oil system, stiction is the sticky friction that negatively impacts your engine's ability to function at an optimal level. The molecular structure of oil is a hydrocarbon. The engine's extreme heat, tight tolerances, and high pressure cause the oil to break down and release hydrogen, leaving behind varnish, a carbon-based deposit. The varnish clings to the engine's moving parts, creating drag on the turbocharger, oil pump, and pistons. Since 
symptoms of stiction include a rough idle and the loss of fuel economy and performance. Hot Shot Secret Stiction Eliminator delivers a 98% clean rating in third-party scrub tests. Its synthetic cleaner plus nano lubricant contains no harmful solvents and is formulated to be left in the engine to safely dissolve stiction for thousands of miles. It works as you drive. Stiction Eliminator is available at truck stops, tractor supply, O'Reilly's Auto Parts, and online at hotshotsecret.com. Hot Shot Secrets, powered by science. Welcome back in TNC Radio Live. This is Building Strong Minds with Dr. Christopher Cortman and uh, Dr. Chris um, talking about the social black belt. Let's keep going. All right. So we talked about that our emotions are not strange visitors, that we can understand them, we could champion them. And I promised you we we're going to talk about at least four parts to that today. That's the first truth. And the first part is that our emotions do not come from situations, events, other people. They always come from our perceptions of such. The way I look at the world, the way I think. Uh, a famous psychologist named Seligman talked about our explanatory style. The way we explain the world to ourselves has everything to do with how we end up feeling. And the second part of that is that our emotions are always statements about us. Your, sta- your emotions are statements about you and my emotions are statements about me. And if you have a way of perceiving the world as being a beautiful place with lots of opportunity, uh, maybe it is or maybe it isn't, but that's the way you're looking at things, and that's going to create how you feel. And then we talked fl- about the flip side of that, the Eeyores of the world, going back to Winnie the Pooh, that you can always find negative. You can always find reasons to complain. You can always find imperfections. And um, that's a statement about you if you can always find you know, some, some kind of blemish. But it's a statement about you when you can find the silver lining on the cloud, so to speak. So let's continue with this. The third part of it is that all of our emotions are statements about our investments. You need to be invested in something in order to have emotion. Emotions do not come again, from situations, but they come from the way we look at the world and we have to care about something. We have to be invested in something or else there's no emotion. For instance, um, I consider myself to be a uh, crazy sports fan because I absolutely love sports, but there are some sports that I don't care at all about. I Not that they aren't great sports, but I'm not invested in them. And so while I love baseball and football and basketball, I don't know a thing or care a thing about hockey or NASCAR or some other sports. I, I, I'm just, I'm not there. I don't, I don't have, I don't have a dog in the race. I guess we might as well use that as a sport, dog racing. I don't. I don't care about those sports. And so, you know, I can appreciate a a hockey game. We have the uh, Lightning here in Tampa Bay. They, you know, they won the consecutive Stanley Cups and almost a third one. And when I go to a game, it's amazing. It's fun. But um, I have to be honest. I don't I don't follow them. I don't really know their players or I'm not invested. So if when they lost this year in the Stanley Cup, it didn't even cause me 30 seconds of grief, let alone sleepless nights or upsets or any. You have to be invested. That's my point. And whenever you react strongly about something, I got news for you. That's an indication that you were invested in something. There is some part of you that is greatly invested about anything that you react strongly to. Otherwise, you would have one of those reactions of 
Hey, did you see the game last night? Uh, no. You know, you know who won? No, don't care. Right. You, you wouldn't feel anything unless you're invested. And that's a huge part in, in helping someone because we always want to trace it back to where is your investment? Where's your investment? I told you about this gifted school. And so I asked kids questions about anxiety. And much to my amazement, these kids, these top percentile kids are off the charts anxious. They're very, very bright, but they don't have the emotional um, wherewithal to, to manage all that's going on in their heads. In other words, there's a discrepancy between their maturity intellectually versus their maturity emotionally. I hope that makes sense. And I was like, what are you guys so anxious about? Why? And I'll ask them, how many of you, I've just given you a really good description of what anxiety is and where it comes from. Um, it's got to be investment plus the perception of threat. What do you, where's the anxiety coming from? You guys know? And I'll say, wait a minute. I know what it is. You guys are anxious pending the results of the Rays game against the White Sox tonight. Isn't that it? And they go, who are the Rays? <laughs> what, what is that? What are you talking about? It's like, oh, yeah, I forgot. Most of you are not baseball fans. Okay. So I've narrowed it down. That's not what it is. And then it's like, what is it? What is it? There's got to be threat somewhere, right? But there has to be investment. What are you invested in? And then they'll raise their hands and start. And they'll say, I'm invested in my future, in my education, in my career. It's like, that's great. Where's the threat? And they're like, look around. This one's a genius. This one's off the charts. This one's, and, and you know, we're, we're off on a little bit of a tangent. But you know what I say to them? I say, oh, so you're, you're concerned about competition with all these other kids? And they're like, yeah. I was like, oh, that's great. I said, um, you know what the kids from my graduating class in high school are doing right now? And they look at me like, what? I said, I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, I wish them well, but I have no idea what they're doing. Um, and ultimately, it doesn't matter. It has no bearing on my career whatsoever. They're not competition for me. It has nothing to do with me or my life. I wish them all well, but there's no competition. I'm not competing with any of them about anything. And I want you to understand that your only competition here is yourself. Now relax and enjoy. And, and you know, one of the kids raises his hand and, and says, I'm anxious, Dr. Cortman, because I want to be a lawyer and I don't know if I could do it. I said, how old are you? He said, 14. I said, I don't know any 14-year-old lawyers, but I'll tell you what to do if you want to be a lawyer. Are you ready for this? He said, yeah. I said, get a pen and something to write on. I'm going to tell you what to do. He said, um, stay in school today and do what they tell you. And when you go home tonight, do your homework and come back tomorrow. Make sure you come back because today's Wednesday. Come back and um, do what they tell you to do in school. And then tomorrow night, do your homework and keep doing that. And 11 years from now, you'll graduate from law school. And I said, you know, I have the right to say that because if you're bright enough to get into this school, then you have what it takes to graduate from law school. And you know who ends up graduating from schools like that? People who just keep doing what they're supposed to do one day at a time. If you want, you could worry your pretty little head off, but that's, that's the best recommendation I can give you. Just do what you're supposed to do one day at a time. Anyway, all of this to say that our emotions come back to what we're invested in. And you will never have strong emotion without caring about something. And if you don't know what that something is, I recommend you start out with what it isn't. You know, it's, it's not this, it's not this. And, and pretty soon you can trace it back to, there's some part of this that really matters to me or I wouldn't be reacting very strongly. You probably want to take the last break, no? Uh, we've got another minute. Okay. All right. So let's stay with that for just a minute. 
One of the best quotes on that, and forgive me for um, going into uh, religious, spiritual, biblical kinds of things, but um, Jesus talked about investments. And he said, um, he used the word treasure, though. He said, um, you know, the people tend to put treasures on things, and then those things are ruined by thieves and by rust and by moths. You know, things can be ruined like that. And he says, um, don't, don't put all your investment, don't make your treasure on those kinds of things because those things, you know, they're corruptible. They're going to, something's going to happen to them. Put your treasures, your investments in things that really matter, things of a heavenly nature, things that are permanent. And then a great line that I'd love to borrow, it says, because where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Yep. Where your investment is, the things that matter to you, that's where your heart is. And so I like people to know, you know, even people who are starting the date, you know, people are going to tell you that, oh, I'm into God, family, and country. <laughs> you know, it's great. But if you want to know what, they re what really matters to them, watch what they get strongly emotional about. Watch what makes them angry. Watch what makes them happy. You can learn much more by watching their behavior than by what they profess matters most to them. Well, this has been great. Uh, let's take our last break and come back and uh, uh, see where this ends up for the evening. You're listening to TNC Radio Live, Building Strong Minds with Dr. Christopher Cortman. Stay right there. The best GPS for truck drivers. Although there's several GPS apps, it's better for truck drivers to rely on a system that's specifically geared toward their type of work. Smartphone apps lack the ability to show truckers the roads that are inaccessible to trucks. Buying the right GPS for trucking can be tricky and overwhelming. To save you from tons of research and reading reviews, the Truckers Network has listed the best GPS devices for truck drivers in 2020. Check out their website. Here's a brief list. Garmin Dezel 580 LMTS. The Garmin Dezel 580 LMTS is an easy-to-use GPS with hands-free Bluetooth and built-in Wi-Fi. It features customized truck routing for the size and weight of your truck. It also provides helpful predictive route warnings for dangerous curves, steep grades, bridge heights, weight limits, and more. You can find nearby hotels, restaurants, and parking with their easy brake planning. This GPS is truly made for the long haul. Other features include customized truck routing, built-in directory of truck and trailer services, easy brake planning, and service history log. The TomTom Tom Trucker 620. The TomTom Tom Trucker 620 is a six inch GPS navigation device that allows you to get the most out of your driving time. The TomTom Tom Trucker 620 can connect by Wi-Fi, and that lets you update without a computer. It makes calling and messaging easier by providing hands-free calling and smartphone services. It also provides free real-time traffic updates and truck maps throughout North America. Other features include battery lifetime up to an hour. It reads messages out loud from a smartphone. It's compatible with Siri and Google Now. It has customized truck routing. The Garmin Drive Smart 61 LMTS. This Garmin device makes trucking much easier. The Navigator features a collection of smart features, in addition to easy-to-follow instructions and helpful driver alerts. It also provides hands-free calling, live traffic information, and built-in Wi-Fi. With this GPS device, all you have to do is look up and drive. Other features include voice-activated navigation, Bluetooth calling, select live parking, and a rechargeable lithium-ion battery that lasts up to an hour. At Hot Shot Secret, we share the science behind common diesel problems. For example, diesel fuel cetane levels. The cetane rating in diesel fuel is 42 to 45. Most diesel engines operate more efficiently with a cetane rating of 48 to 50. One treatment of Hot Shot Secret Diesel Extreme will raise your cetane 7 points, increase fuel economy, and improve cold starts. Hot Shot Secret Diesel Extreme is available nationwide at truck stops, fine farm and auto stores, and online at hotshotsecret.com. Hot Shot Secret, powered by science.
Welcome back in TNC Radio Dot Live, building strong minds with Dr. Christopher Cortman. I'm Tom Kelly. Uh, Dr. Chris, before we wrap things up here, real quickly, um, you mentioned that there was a book involved here. How can people find that book and and uh, order that or learn more about it? Okay, so anytime anyone wants to get a hold of me, SRQ Shrink. Dot com is the way to get there. Um, yeah, the first book that was published is called Your Mind, an Owner's Manual. And from that, the Social Black Belt program was born. And now there's a separate book called The Social Black Belt, which was the same book that has been completely rewritten for adolescents. And that's the one that you know we're using in some of the schools because that's age appropriate. The first book was written for adults. And I have a couple of other books if people are interested, but um, people are always able to order those books off Amazon and they can see me at srqshrink.com. And of course, uh, those who are on TikTok, look up TikTok Shrink and uh, the, my Mental Health Minutes, the videos, um are there and uh, the mental health minutes are, are great for people with a short attention span because they only average about two minutes long and that's uh that's usually about as much as people can handle listening to me so uh, <laughs> that works out well <laughs> and you can hear those mental health minutes throughout the day here on tnc radio dot live as well appreciate that thank you so we've got, uh, let's see, about six and a half minutes left. So we're okay. at that time left. What we're going to do now is talk about one more important part of emotions. And I have to admit that I really like this part because the analogy works really well for me. And I think it will for the truckers out there. Because in this case, I compare our emotions to the dummy lights on the dashboard of a vehicle. And that is, any time that a dummy light goes on, it is a message from the vehicle. It, it, it's an important message that something's gone awry, or here's a notice that you need to pay attention to, like your fuel level is low, or your oil level is low, or the one that I used to um, really pay a lot of attention to, and that is the rear door on the driver's side was open because I would always think that um, if my son falls out, his mother's going to be really mad at me. So I would use that dummy light to notify me of something I wasn't aware of, pull the car over, and then shut the door. And when I shut the door, something amazing happened. That light went off. It was a success. It transmitted a message to me that was received and responded to. And we had, a, we had perfection. It worked. And I want people to understand that your emotions can work very much like that. When your guilt light goes on, for instance, it's not random. You don't just wake up feeling guilty. You wake up and you have guilt because you perceive, remember it all goes back to perceptions. You perceive that you have betrayed, you have, you have behaved in a way that betrayed your own moral code. You have fallen short in some way uh, of what you expected of yourself, and therefore you feel guilty. When I mentioned before about anxiety and all these really gifted kids. Anxiety comes from the perception of threat to something that I'm invested in. You will not just have anxiety. You have anxiety because you perceive something threatening. And some people have learned to see the whole world as threatening all the time. So they're always anxious. They, they have a disorder, a psychiatric disorder called generalized anxiety disorder, GAD. And what that means is 
Your dummy light's always on. You're always anxious. Everything's threatening. You see the world through that perspective that something terrible is always going to happen. And it, it's just a, a really, um, oh, shall we say, a, a self-defeating perception of the world. It's an explanatory style that says the world is very dangerous and life is going to be most difficult. And, and trust nothing, um, trust no one, live in hypervigilance. And for those of you who haven't heard that term before, that means overly watchful. You know who are who, what people have hyper vigilance? People who've been raped, or people who have um, have come back from combat. And um, you know the world is a dangerous place. If, if I can, I, I know we're always watching time, but I want to tell you about a guy that came back from the military, and he was like twenty seven years old. And he said, I had to come in because I was walking around um, St. Armand's uh, Circle with my girlfriend. And that's a really ritzy, beautiful place in Sarasota, you know, where, where the average age has got to be in the upper 70s of people who walk around um, St. Armand's Circle. And um, there was an opening in the traffic to walk. And I yelled to my girlfriend, no! Nah! Let's go. And she was really upset that I would yell to her at her like that. And I said, what was going on? And he said, I just, I, I just don't know who I could trust. You know, he talked about those IEDs, the explosives that, that little old ladies had in Afghanistan where he was. And he didn't know who he could trust. The world is unsafe. So his anxiety light was always on because he didn't know when it was safe and what was safe and who was safe. The entire world had become this dangerous place, even when he was in an upscale neighborhood with absolutely no perceived threats for anyone else. You know, the rest of the world walked around like they're in a beautiful place. And the worst thing that they could, that could happen is they'd be overcharged for an ice cream cone at Kilwins. But this guy was anxious, Tom, because he had been programmed by going in, in, in combat to see the world as, as, a, as a threatening and as a dangerous place. So my point is, every one of these emotions, and we can talk about more about this next time because I don't want to shortchange the listeners, but every one of my emotions is the dummy light going on and sending me a message so I could respond appropriately. Why is your anger light on? Uh, because I perceive a violation somewhere. Stop for a minute and look at the things that make you angry. You're angry because you perceive a violation to something you're invested in. Why is my sad light on? Because I perceive a loss. And these are the things I want people to understand. My emotions are not strange visitors. They're telling me a story, and I need to respond well to it. I know you got to go. Yeah, we got to run. We're out of time, but uh, yeah. it's, been a, it's been a great great uh, hour with you. Thank you so much. You're listening to TNC Radio.Live. Stay tuned next for Hope Zavara. Do you have the TNC Radio.Live app? It's free and easy to download. Just go to app.tnc Radio.Live, Google Play, or the App Store. Get access to live streaming radio developed by drivers for drivers. Download the TNC Radio.Live app today. Don't forget, you can hear all of our TNC Radio primetime shows again on our podcasts. Just go to tncradio.live slash podcasts or search for tncradio.live wherever you listen to podcasts.